Hello and welcome to Hacks. So, this week I have been reading Real World Bug Hunting, A Field Guide to Web Hacking. Uh, written by Peter Yorosky. I apologise if I didn't pronounce that correctly. And published by No Starch Press. Uh, I picked it up on Amazon for about 20 quid. And yeah, it is what the title says. It's a book about real world bug hunting um why did i buy it well you know i've been in cyber security for about two years now and my web application skills are they leave a lot to be desired you know i do a lot of imp but i've done so many web application skills now and i feel like i struggle to see the trees through the forest i believe the saying goes you know i find like low hanging fruit and i find a lot of exploits or a lot of potential vulnerabilities but i feel like i could be doing a better job and i want to learn more you know i want to know the secrets that all the master hackers have but yeah so i decided to buy this book to look for examples really and it's it wasn't what i thought it was gonna be silly me i thought it was gonna be a book on how to hack everything but no it it's it does give a methodology at the end which i'll talk about near the end but so it goes through like pretty much all the different types of vulnerabilities that you can find on web applications you know and it gives real world examples of the different exploits that have been found on the bug bounty website hacker one which is really good and it it discusses how the hackers found them you know he's obviously read through the reports he's submitted some himself so the guy's really experienced in actually um finding the vulnerabilities but to go through them all in this video is it would take forever but uh yeah so he talks like in, in one of the first chapters talks about HTT parameter pollution and what that is is if you have a URL and the example he gives which is perfect is a banking website and if you're attempting to submit like do a funds transfer from one account to the other it may show up in the URL is like account amount and destination account and he suggests that by adding an additional parameter for you know origin account at the end he suggests that based on how the server processes the information it could process that origin account last but validate based on the first account which would mean that the funds get taken from the account that's specified in the last parameter so if you've got bills to pay and you don't have the money in your bank you know you could add the last parameter on and it would take it from their bank account instead not that i'm condoning such things and you would hope that would never happen but i have seen this in in the real world you know when you're um when you've got different headers and they're using like basic authentication you can specify like in the first in, in the m top most line you'll specify the correct password and then the line underneath it you'll select the you'll submit the incorrect password and based on how the server processes it it will either be correct or incorrect so if it processes the first parameter being the correct password you'll authenticate but if it pa if it processes the second pr like uh, header then it won't so it's really good and he uses the example of twitter and subscribe notifications which i thought was funny so he found a http parameter pollution vulnerability in the in the twitter unsubscribe to notifications functionality and it allowed him to unsubscribe other users from certain notifications and i, I just generally thought this was hilarious um you know you're just hacking somebody else's account just so you can unsubscribe them for something but the bug bounty hacker got a uh, you know reward for doing it so it's really good um another chapter cross-site request forgery this is a exploit that allows a malicious threat actor to generate a malicious site with a request embedded in it and then they can send the link to the malicious site to an unsuspecting user then when the user clicks the link it opens the malicious website which has the hidden request and uh, the request is usually to perform an action on a site that the user may already be authenticated against so the one example i tend to use is password changes so if you can capture a password request change for a site like facebook or something like that 
um, you can then spec like change it so that it has your own passwords this is provided you don't need the initial like the the original password um, and then you send that link to uh, a victim and when they open it it will change their account password provided they don't have cross-site request forgery tokens uh, on there but uh, the example that he gives in the book is Shopify and Twitter disconnects and Shopify is, is a shopping website which I'm sure you know and Twitter is the social media platform but there was a functionality in Shopify that allowed you to link your Shopify account to your Twitter account and one of the uh, hackers found a way to disconnect Twitter accounts based on cross-site request forgery but there's loads of other examples in here there's like a, a Badu full account takeover change user instacart zones there's so much in here and I, I can't touch on all of them obviously during the video because it's just there's a wealth of information in this book. Um, carriage return line feed injections. This is when input sanitization on websites don't sanitize properly and they don't sanitize special characters like carriage returns and line feeds. And what you can do is you can URL encode like, uh, have you ever seen it in your URL when you've got a space in there and the, the URL will say percentage 20? to show that it's a space. Well, it's saying how this can be used, these URL encoded values or just encoded values in general to perform threats, uh, to perform exploits. And one such exploit was a Twitter HTTP response split, which allowed a hacker by the name of File Descriptor to create cookies, essentially. Again, I'm not doing it justice, but the details in each in each of these real world examples, it has the URLs, it, it goes into a lot of detail. Cross-site scripting, everybody loves a bit of XSS. Author does a great job of explaining the difference between reflective and persistent, and goes on to explain how sites such as Shopify, Yahoo Mail, all had sort of cross-site scripting. You know, there was a Yahoo Mail example where they were formatting they were performing input sanitization on JavaScript, but they weren't taking into account malformed image tags. Um, that allowed a threat actor to put in a stored uh, cross-site scripting attack using malformed image tags because they weren't validating it properly. Google Image Search was vulnerable to a cross-site scripting attack and Google Tag Manager stored XSS, United Airlines XSS. And each example he goes through, he does sort of provide the URL, he even provides a URL to the report, which I would love to spend some time going through and reading because the complexity of some of these attacks, how they found them, you know, how they got their initial sort of inkling that there was a vulnerability there, then going on and finding the cross-site scripting attack to then leveraging it into something else entirely, it, it just blows my mind. SQL injections, uh, the guy explains how SQL injections are likely the most rewarded bug bounty because their impact is huge, it's significant. If you've got SQL injection then you know you can dump your entire customer database and sell that information on the dark web. Um, some cases with F SQL injection you can get shells on the box using SQL map and XP command shell, you know there's, there's a lot of damage that can be done with SQL injection and I've not found one before in a while I thought I found a blind SQL injection before but it was just the like way the application was behaving with certain different errors um, but they talk about how Yahoo Sports had a blind SQL injection and the hacker found it based entirely off of the way that the site was rendering images after he submitted the SQ the blind SQL injection fantastic like discovery a couple of years ago, you would hear about phone companies that fell victim to SQL injections where their entire customer databases were dumped to the dark, to the dark web. Subdomain enumeration using tools like Sublister and it says how like subdomain takeovers where S3 buckets have been created. So the subdomain still existed, but the S3 bucket no longer existed. So the user then created an S3 bucket using the same naming convention that the site previously did so that when the bucket was up and running the domain pointed to that s3 bucket still which could allow them to host nefarious content or anything it's it's 
you know, it's amazing how hack some hackers' minds work. And I just, you know, I suppose you've got to learn these examples in order to up your own skills. But yeah, I feel like I'm going on a little bit, but there's like so many decent examples in here. But he also offers a methodology as well, which is what I was mainly looking for when I purchased the book. And it's, it's not an in-detailed methodology like you would find in the web application Hacker's Handbook. It's more of like real-world advice from a tried and tested bug bounty finder. He explains how you should set up and be ready to go into your penetration test how you should read like the scope of the document specifically the policies and then he explains once you're going after a specific vulnerability how you should focus entirely on that until you pop it or you know until you move on which is really good because a lot of the times if a site is huge you can get distracted with different sort of things that you notice and you'll be trying to find a cross-site scripting bug but then you'll notice something else and go after that instead uh, but the main takeaway that I got from the book, honestly, was persistence. And not just persistence in finding bugs, but persistence in your whole sort of journey through testing, through learning, through cybersecurity, through the industry. But it can be applied to any industry, really. It's just persisting through each challenge that you have. Um, you know, each of these hackers, they didn't find the bug instantly. They found like an initial suggestion that a bug might be there. Then they exploited it and then they found ways that the sort of exploit could be elevated to a more devastating impact. And then they would submit the bug, you know, and it's, it's good to do that to show the true impact of what this bug could be leveraged to do. And that persistence is what got them there. And I feel like that's a, like the main message that I've taken away from the book is persistence in uh testing in in my career and everything so yeah i i highly rated this book it wasn't what i thought it was going to be um i was hoping for a book that would teach me how to hack web applications i've got the web application hackers handbook which i've partially read through but no this book uh provides great world real world examples it won't teach you to be a master hacker but no book will uh, but it's a good read, and I would recommend it to anybody in the industry who hasn't read it yet. So, anyway, that's all I got. I hope you enjoyed it, and I didn't rub it on too much, but kind regards. Bye. <laughs>